All right, TVO kids, who is the first Canadian to walk in space? Chris Hadfield! <laughs> and who is the first Canadian commander of the International Space Station? Chris Hadfield! And who is the first Canadian commander of the International Space Station to be here with us in the space? Chris Hadfield! <laughs> A big warm round of applause, everyone, for Chris Hadfield! <laughs> Colonel Chris Hadfield, we are so honored to have you here. It Thank is so much. nice to be here with everybody. Thanks are we for all, inviting me. Are we all over the moon that Chris Hadfield is here? Yeah! We're going to get to an email, if that's okay. I'm ready. So this one is from Umar, who's uh, from Toronto. And Umar asks, when did you become an astronaut? Or when did you decide to become an astronaut? Umar, I, uh, I decided to become an astronaut when I was nine years old. Uh, I was just about to turn 10. It was the summertime. And... It was in July, a nice hot night. I watched the very first two people walk on the moon. Wow. And I decided right then, nine years old, that I wanted to be an astronaut, but I had, I had no idea how. I in in I, that picture, perhaps, as uh, well? That's, that's me. So your there. first yeah. rocket? <laughs> but I didn't know how to, that's my first simulator anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but I just thought, well, I have to keep my body in shape and have to go to school and plan to go to university and maybe learn to fly. And so I did all those things, but it really wasn't for 26 years later before I flew in space. Wow. Long time from when I decided to be an astronaut, started turning myself into an astronaut, till I flew in space. It was a long time. And we didn't have a space agency, TVO Kids, um, when Mr. Hadfield decided he wanted to be an astronaut. Right. It wasn't hard then. It was impossible. <laughs> I decided to do something that was impossible, but I figured things change over time, and if I don't decide, it'll never happen. So I just started turning myself into one, and now I flew in space three times. We have our first audience question. We're gonna go over to Jasmine over here. Jasmine has a fun question. What is your question for Chris Hadfield? When you were in outer space, what fun things did you do there? Boy, Jasmine, one of the most fun things about being in outer space is being weightless. Imagine right now if someone just tapped you on the head and said, you can fly. What, what are all the things that you would do? You, so what, what I would do, I would do somersaults. I'd just do a, a hundred somersaults, or I'd push off one side of the space station and fly to the other, or I'd try and go down the whole length of the space station, and by the time I got to the other end, I tried to touch my feet and then fly all the way back and touch my feet, tried to be the world's best weightless gymnast. It's just so much fun uh, being weightless in space. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a toy you can always play with. You'd love it. This is another email here. Um, this is from Isa in Toronto. Hi, Chris Hadfield. I have a few questions for you. First of all, how does it feel when there is no gravity? So something that the kids maybe could... It feels a little bit like to. you're standing on your head. Because even though you don't think about it, you're used to gravity pulling you down. It holds, if you've got long hair, it holds your hair down. Kind of holds your clothes down on your body. You don't really think about it. So as soon as gravity goes away. As soon as you're weightless, your shirt kind of floats up and your hair floats up and it feels sort of like you're being sucked up to the roof of the room. It's weird. Even though you're not, even though you're just floating weightless, it feels somehow like you're like you're being pulled up to the ceiling. But after a while, you get used to it and then you're you're maybe like a goldfish in a bowl or a bird in the sky and you're just free to fly around. I have an audience question. This one, Tyler, hold the mic right up to your mouth. And what is your question for Chris Hadfield? What is something that you saw in space that you didn't expect to see or you haven't seen before? Tyler, you know when, when a lightning storm, when a thunderstorm is coming to somewhere in Ontario, and you know what it looks like, right? It's sort of dark on the horizon, and then it comes closer and closer, and then there's storm and dark, but with a bunch of bright flashes. Imagine what it's like to look at one of those storms from up in space. You can see the whole storm from one side to the other. And every lightning flash that you might see where you live suddenly is part of hundreds of lightning flashes over the whole storm. And what I didn't expect to see was that a lightning storm, how huge they can be, but also they sort of look like like uh, an enormous light bulb where someone keeps turning the light on super bright here, then super bright here, and you can just count the hundreds of, of, of flashes that are going on. It's beautiful and it's lit from within. Like maybe if someone took some, some cauliflower and suddenly made it light inside and then dark inside. It's just beautiful and mesmerizing and very different to look at a storm from on the space station. We have uh, Isabel now on the phone, we have a caller. Hi. Hi Isabel, what's your question for Colonel Chris Hadfield? How did you feel when you got told that you were going to be the commander of the International Space Station? Good question. 
question. Isabel, Isabel. That's, that's a good question. Imagine if someone called you on the phone and said, we want you to be an astronaut. Or if someone called you on the phone and said, we want you to fly in a spaceship next year. Or even what you just said, we want you to be the commander of the world's spaceship. It's a pretty amazing phone call to get. And in my case, I was actually not by phone. I got called into someone's office and they said, hey, we'd like you to command the spaceship. There's going to be a lot of work. You're going to have these people. You got to get all ready. It's still going to be several years. And you're like all serious about it and you're thinking about it in all your job. But inside you, there's a little person going, I'm going to command a spaceship. It's really exciting. And so, so it's kind of serious, important. You have to do your job right, but at the same time, it's a it's a thrill. It's a lot of fun, and and I'm still excited about the fact. And that, who is that the I got first that. person that you called uh, when you found out? Uh, I, I called my mom and, and talked to her, and I said, "Mom, you can't tell anybody. Can't tell anybody." And she said, "Okay." And then I called my grandpa, and by the time I called my grandpa, he said, "Oh yeah, your mom just called." <laughs> so, so yeah, it's. But I called my family. Oh, that's wonderful. Ooh, okay, we have another audience question. I am going to go all the way over here to our friend Ava. Ava, be nice and loud and put the mic right up. Can you bring animals on the space station? And Ava wanted to know, can you bring your own pet? That Ava, can we bring animals and our own pet on the space station? Not yet, no. Uh, animals would have trouble without gravity, you know, because even something like this glass mm -hmm. of water right here it can only go one way. If I tip this glass over on Earth, you know what's going to happen. It's going to cause a mess. In space, it would be very different. It would behave so differently. And imagine if you had your dog in space. Dogs are used to being right side up, not floating around upside down. <laughs> and they would panic and they would scrabble around. And how would they go to the bathroom? And where, if they shed hair, where would their shedding hair go? And, and it would just, it would be a big problem. So, we have robot pets on board. And the commander of the space station right now, his name is Koichi, Koichi Wakata from Japan. And Koichi has a small robot pet on board that was made in Japan for him. So a very simple pet, one that doesn't need to eat, doesn't go to the bathroom, but will still sort of act like a friend to you, like a pet would. So a little bit of companionship. Okay, bit. Um, I'm going to an email now. This one is from Charlotte from Toronto. And Charlotte wants to know how long does it take to get up into space? Charlotte, uh, to get to space, you have to get going a certain speed really, really <laughs> fast. Like you have to get going uh, faster than you can even imagine. Eight kilometers a second. It's hard to even think how fast it is. It's like from one side of Canada to the other in 10 minutes. That's how fast you're going. Or right around the world in 90 minutes, around the world 16 times eight. So you have to get from sitting on the ground, just like me in this swivel chair, to get going eight kilometers a second. And you need a rocket ship that can do that. And first you have to get up above the air because the air is too thick to go fast in. So the rocket first spends a couple minutes getting you above the air, and then the rocket just starts pushing you faster and faster, and you're squished back in your chair with a heavier and heavier and heavier weight until finally the rocket ship is going exactly the right speed and the engine shut off and you're weightless floating around. And that amount of time was nine minutes. From the time you're sitting on the ground until you're floating weightless in space, nine minutes. And do you have to train your body in order to be able to absorb that pressure as well? What do you guys do to get ready? How would you train for a rocket launch? First, you, the, the, you drive the spaceship. So first you have to understand everything about the spaceship and that's really complicated. Mm -hmm. Spaceships are really complicated. So we train on that a lot. But part of it, as you say, is just what's it going to do to your body. And to do that, we get in the thing called a centrifuge, which is like a, a, a cockpit or, or part of a spaceship that's on the end of a long, long boom. And then you swing that boom around and around and around. And it's sort of like being a stone on the end of a string. And you get squished in the cockpit as it swings around. So you learn what it's going to feel like, how hard it's going to be to lift up your arm against all that extra force of gravity, how you can throw the switches when you're getting squished and, uh, and make sure that you can do your job right. I have a question uh, from another audience member. I'm going to pass back the mic right here. Brendan, you can ask your question. Put the mic right up to your mouth, okay? In 10 years, do you think that humans will still be traveling to space or will it only be robots? In 10 years, question. will people or robots be traveling to space? Uh, both. We send robots all over the yep. place. I mean, uh, we send uh, robot. I mean, think about it. If you probably have a dishwasher at home. It's a robot, right? <laughs> It's really a simple little robot. You push dishes in, you push some buttons, and it works for a while, and then out come clean dishes. Like your washing machine, same thing. 
And we have some robots that are driving around on Mars, looking at Mars. But robots don't really matter. People matter. You know, we sent the robots to tell us things. The robots didn't decide to do that themselves. They're just like toasters and dishwashers for us. They're just doing stuff for us. And what really matters okay. is, is uh, what we decide to do and what we think about. And so always it'll be a mixture. It'll be a mixture of robots trying to find out some of the hard information. And then once we've figured out where we want to go, then it'll always be people going and maybe you. Okay, excellent. We actually have another caller. We have Jack on the phone. Hi, Jack. What's your question for Chris? What do you have to do to become an astronaut? Jack, that's a good question. What do you have to do to become an astronaut? A lot of things, but really three main things. Number one is you're going to go live on a spaceship, so they don't want you to get sick. So you have to have a healthy body, and that means just exercise a little bit and don't eat too much. Just take care of your body. Number two is you need to have the ability to understand things, complicated things, and learn complicated things. So if you were the Canadian Space Agency, and you were thinking, we want to choose an astronaut, who are we going to choose? We want someone who obvious, obviously knows how to learn things. So we choose people that have been to university, that have an advanced university education, because that means they've shown that they can learn complicated things. So keep your body in shape, okay. go to university, and then the third part is, we want people who know how to make good decisions. And all of you make decisions all the time, but you can get better at it. Make decisions and stick with your decisions. You know, when a car is driving down the road, it's normally best if someone has at least one hand on the steering wheel. Your life is sort of like a car going, going down the road. And if, if you're not steering which way your life's going, then it's just sort of random. And your life is the result of your decisions. So just think about it. Make some decisions and stick with them. What am I going to do next? What am I going to read? What, what am I going to, who am I going to be? What am I going to do? And those little decisions, even the little ones, what am I going to eat? What am I going to watch on TV? What book am I going to read next? They turn you into who you're going to be. They direct which way you go in your life. Uh, what's your name? Beth. Beth, and what's your question for Chris? How do they make the International Space Station without all the parts floating away? All of the parts are built all around the world, Beth, including right across Canada. And it's pretty hard because the space station's already been up there for 16 or 17 years. So how do you know your new piece is even going to fit? Because you can't test it. So we have, we have simulators on the ground. We have lots of drawings and pictures. And then uh, the space station goes around the world like the moon. Like, like the moon doesn't fall down and the moon doesn't fly away. So it's in kind of a permanent orbit around the world, the space station is. And then as we drive up and fly up, we have to carefully dock and then we use the big Canadian robot arm, Canada arm, to grab a piece, pick it out and attach it to the space station one at a time. And when it attaches, we have a bunch of bolts or clips or snaps or some sort of mechanism, hooks, that puts it together so that it's permanently attached like, like pieces of your car so that, uh, so that they won't float away. That's a great question. Okay, I, I saw you. Um, can you just say your name and what your question is? My name is Isaac. And my question is, um, how do you exercise in space? Isaac, it's important to exercise on Earth, but it's even more important to exercise when you're weightless because you can be so lazy <laughs> when you're weightless. You don't even have to hold up your head. You know, think about it. You can be so lazy. It's like you don't even have to pick, you don't have to lift a finger. So we exercise and we have three different pieces of exercise equipment. One is, is a treadmill, a spinning treadmill, but you'd fly away. So it has big elastics on it to hold you down on the treadmill while you run. We have a bicycle. It doesn't have a seat because you don't need to sit down, but it just has pedals and you can pedal the bicycle. It's a resistive, like a stationary bike. And it's fun because you can bicycle once around the world. It just takes 90 minutes and you bicycle around the world. <laughs> and then the last thing we have is, is like a, a, a weightlifting machine, but you can't lift weights when you're weightless. So it just has resistance in it. It's a resistive exercise device, sort of like pushing against springs. And that way you exercise your heart, your lungs, and all of the muscles and bones of your body and you stay in shape. Okay, one more back here. Can you take the mic and big loud voice and say your name as well? My name's Isaiah and uh, my question is, what was your favorite mission that you went on and why? Isaiah, I flew in space three times. The first time to go help build the Russian space station, Mir. The second time to do spacewalks to help build our arm, Canada arm, 
on the International Space Station. And the third time I flew in space was to go live there and to command the International Space Station. I like them all a lot, but I think I like the last one the best because instead of just being there for a week or two, I was there for five months and I got to do everything I ever dreamed of. You know, and if I didn't do it right now, I could try it again next month. I got to try all sorts of stuff. I had to get haircuts. I was up there so long. I, you know, I had to trim my mustache and, you know, I had to, had to, I was up, had to trim my fingernails. I was up there so long, but it really was a chance to, I went around the world 2,600 times get to know the whole planet. And I think getting to know the world in a new way, that was the best part of the whole thing. Colonel Chris Hadfield, I'm sorry, that was the last question, unfortunately, but thank you so much for being here. Did you guys enjoy it? Yeah! Excellent.